Okay, we are here. Everyone is here. So, thank you very much for coming to this uh, NIHAS uh, uh, seminar. And uh, I'm glad to see uh, we have a distinguished emeritus professor of physics, Professor John Hay. Yeah, distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, UK is in. UK is a very good job uh, at doing that. Uh, so, but I'm glad to see you here. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Professor Hay, for the long time, Professor Phillips, uh, retired, uh, that's in Canada, and he comes regularly to the uh, job. Nice. Uh, and he, what makes it particularly appropriate is that he's a very good friend of Narayesh uh, Dash. So, uh, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for coming. And uh, uh, most of you know <coughs> in the last day, that is, so I won't go into great detail, but I should, for those of you who don't, point out to you that uh, uh, he, he finished his studies in India. Uh, the master's was at South Atlantic Italians, and uh, which was uh, the university where the master came out, of course, attached later on. His PhD at Pune University. And he spent many, many years as an academic at Kaduna University and then uh, helped in the creation of the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, which is on campus of Kaduna uh, University. So he became one of the founding professors there, director of the visitor program, and, uh, and later he became director of uh, the Inter University Center himself. Uh, he later on spent his stint at Jamia Melia Islamia as was the Ansari professor. Uh, which is uh, one of the uh, universities in New Delhi. Some of us has been there. We took a uh, group of students, including Shiva and uh, Shivani. Sure. And <laughs> he's now a medicine professor at Ayuka. Uh, 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 it would be needless of me not to say that he's uh, something of a Shropa, he's an international. He has an example of reputation for his contributions in uh, general relativity. These days, modified gravity theories. And gravity means many uh, novels and manifestation. <clears throat> and we recently, on a, say recently, finished yesterday, was the summer school, in the summer school, um, which is held in Alpine. He, he was one of the school, school lecturers. And, uh, and uh, uh, as you'll find out, uh, Naresh has a very unusual way of conceptually introducing objects in a very you know, nice way. And uh, the students later on uh, uh, mentioned to me that they found this approach very professional. Right. So we are glad that he's agreed to give this intensive course today. And you will, you will find. Something about his unusual and the narration. Over to the narration. Well, thank you very much, Neil, for your always very generous order. So he's one of the guys who knows one thing that he doesn't have much to be generous in words. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it might embarrass that somebody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and like as you said, that I, uh, UK Jordan and uh, Durban in general is not new to me for the last. Since 1992, I've been almost reading uh, almost. Every year or twice in a three years or something like that. And to need her too, I think I it's probably it's, whenever I'm around and they happen to catch me, so I heard me speaking. So today I'm going to speak to you is the equation of motion from particle to heat and the vice versa. So let's say this. <clears throat> so you have a particle and you feel and something like this too. We will 
Mm. Well, what we have seen is generally that <clears throat> two equations are independently given. So you have, say, for the electromagnetic field, you have the Lorentz force for the particle motion. And you have the Maxwell equation for the electromagnetic field. And the question is, could there be a relation between them? Could one be derived from the other? Or if not derived, at least could one be guessed from the other? Of course, we know that the uh, particle's motion is governed by the field. So certainly the field appears in the particle's motion. But not the vice versa. So far as the uh, equation of motion of the field is concerned, particle does not make a direct energy. So that's one question. However, this question changed with the advent of GR, where you had the what do I generally do, right? That's all. The field equation implies the particle equation. So first of all, in a very <clears throat> uh, intuitive way, with the G in GR, the gravitational field is described by the geometry of the space-time. So once the field de describes the geometry of space-time, given the geometry of the space-time for the particles have no motion, is the free motion relative to the ge this geometry. So that is how you that it's intuitively clear that yes, if the field is described by the space time geometry, then the particle motion is also determined by the geometry. And so that part. However, in particular, it has been in 1938, Einstein, Infeld, and Hoffman. The paper in the Annals of Mathematics rigorously derived the geodesic equation from the Einstein's field equations. So, you have this. So, the moment you have this, then it also raises the question could there be a something similar for other? Fundamental fields here. Now, the fundamental fields we have are of two kinds. One are the vector gauge fields. So, vector gauge fields, when it, the symmetry is abelian, then it is your Maxwell's Maxwell field, your usual electromagnetic uh, field you know about. But the vector gauge field also allows you to have a non abelian symmetry. That is, you have a vector field and on which you can put some other decorations to give you the internal symmetry structure. And that internal symmetry structure accounts for the 
other two fundamental fields count as the weak and the strong. With that, symmetry is ICL2 that corresponds to the weak, weak field. And the symmetry is ICO3, then that corresponds to the, uh, the strong force. But as a matter of all these three fundamental fields are vector, vector gauge fields, it's the vector field. Then the other fundamental field that we are left is, is the gravity, which is a tensor field described by the space-time metric being its potential is carried by the space-time space geometry. The question here we then we ask is that for these two fundamental, uh, the, the, these two kinds, two kinds of fundamental forces, is there a some Unifying thing from which you say if something like this happens, then it will make up this field. If something, some other property like this happens, then it is gravity. <clears throat> and that whole thing came essentially asking this sort of thing that is there is a from the particle equation, can I get the field equation or vice versa? Now, in 1948, the great Feynman, by using the atomic relation between coordinates and the velocity, could find the source free part of to derive the source free part of that Maxwell's equation. For which, in other way, we could say the Bianchi part of the Maxwell equation. So that is how first he said, so which which meant he could derive this your divergence of B0 and Kernel of phi is minus del B by del T. So these are the source free part of the equation. And initially you are very excited, then something very fundamental here. But then you soon realize. That he can not get the other pair of the natural equation. And so he forgot about it. Yeah. It was a nice exercise, but doesn't lead to anything uh, so profound or fundamental. Then the situation got revived in 1990. One of the friends of Feynman, Freeman Dyson, he wrote a paper on your American Journal of Physics, saying on Feynman's derivation of Maxwell's equation. And that is what gave rise to a lot of activity. People tried to re-derive it in a different ways. But all what they did ultimately mostly stuck to this. This is the only set they could get. It, with the one sole exception, where uh, the other set was also derived. And but there were some issues about it. Now, with this background, generally you see a student comes to you and you give a problem. I had a student 
Then after joining Alpha, the only student I had, and he was the guy who came with this problem to me. That can be derived the other other pair of the Maxwell situations. And so then we, in our own way, we try to do the work of working. And so what I'm going to speak to you is that these two papers we wrote, this thing, one GRQC, I think it's 9912028, and the other is 01010. Nine C. This is where we consider the non-relativistic things. Uh, and here we consider the relativistic part. And when we consider the relativistic part, so that is what okay, uh, something we should also realize. Then when you have an appropriate framework, then something gets automatically incorporated. So when we consider this in the relativistic frame, that we could get the Maxwell situations all right, but from there emerge the new question which also brought in the greatest gravity. And the, here the two fields got uh, <coughs> your, uh, so the question gets, so ultimately I'm really going to stick to this part of this because that, that is a more complete uh, picture we have. But here it comes a, uh, very interesting new formulation you can have. And that is to say, the equation of particle equation of motion, whether it is linear in four velocity of the particle, or whether it is quadratic in four velocity. And what will that turns out is that the, if the equation particle equation is linear in four velocity of the particle. This gives you the vector gauge fields. If the equation is quadratic, in U A, this gives you Einstein G R. So here we have a, another very remarkable uh, characterization of a gauge vector field and the vector metric fields. Uh, for that, yeah. So let's first start from the first one, and then we come to this. And you said that this is supposed to go up as I do this. Okay, let me go up. Okay, so we so let's so we start with the Maxwell field. So what do we say? The equation of motion of the particles should be linear and four levels. Right, so we write, and u dot a, the four acceleration, and this is equal to be linear in the velocity, you Make this, there should be something here. So you have an FAB, and you should uh, 
what you do. You should balance the, always balance the dimensions when you are writing any equation. So you ought to have some dimension uh, which could be in our usual language length. So this is Q times Q. F, what is it be so far? We don't know what it is. If you like it, comes as a factor to give me the linear law for the velocity. If the force law is linear and for the velocity, I have this. But I know something that you don't. The core acceleration is always orthogonal to the core velocity. So if I dot it with U A, the whole thing, then it must be zero. Or what is to say that would mean F A B U A. That would imply that F must be asymmetric. So you have an, your F A B is <clears throat> Anti-symmetric right? We have come to this. Now, next thing you will ask is, so we want to get this equation. This should follow from from the subscalar quantities, which I vary, I should get this. It should follow from some Lagrangian. So you find what that Lagrangian could be. Should have something like on the variation of that. I should, I should get this. If I have, <laughs> if I can, uh, if I have, this will require that F and we must satisfy the Bianchi identity. Or that is to say, that will give you imply that star FAB must be zero. The star is the host dual. What you have? One half. Theta A B C D F C where this is your volume form. Not not to get afraid of this thing is starting. What is this? This is the Bianchi identity in the familiar terms, the Bianchi identity you, you have is this. Divergence of uh, sorry, del, no, sorry, del C F A P anti symmetrized derivative with G. So this is simply the derivative of F cyclic permutation gives you this. And this is the what is equal to the thing which you had earlier. Where was that? Huh? It is this set which is exactly implied by this. 
So the source tree part of the Maxwell uh, uh, equations simply follow from this that F is, uh, is a derived from a kernel of a four vector. And that would give you this. So the, up to this, it was clear. That's how it all follows. The question then is, what happens? What? How do I get to the other part? And to get to the other thing, we know this. <clears throat> that you have a scalar charge which produces the polar field, polar vector field E. And when the scalar charge moves, then it produces the, your axial vector field B, right? Similarly, as you have a scalar charge, I could as well have a pseudo scalar charge. That will do the inverse. That will produce will be the source for an axial vector, let's say called H, and when it moves, it will produce the polar field D. So I could as well have, like I had an FAB, yeah, which A two way consists of consists of two vectors, a polar vector and axial vector. B. Similarly, now I can have another pair, and let's call this P A B, which which would have the two vectors H and D. The H polar and the D, the, the sorry, H axial and the D, the polar. But what do you think will be the, we will have exactly the same thing, except its property would be, the P will be, I will have property of dual of that. So what you have is that the PAB will have a similar property like the F star in. <clears throat> a priori, this is also equally valid, this is also, so if we want, want to, so similarly when we, I do this, I will have an, a, del P of star P A B equal to zero. And what is that going to correspond to? Similar to this, <clears throat> what you what you will have is you will have a which when you want first anyway, so I think you have a Divergence of D zero, and you have a kernel of edge as or not, not minus or it's plus delta D of delta D. So you have other things. Another simple way of looking at this. 
this that you have in a, when you do this dual transformation, FAB from E and B in the, uh, the duality transformation, F going to F star, what you have is the E goes to E and B goes to minus E. So that's the exact. So now you see that we have these two, two sets of equations. One this, and one its counterpart, which let me rewrite here, which was at the divergence of B equals to zero. And you have a curl of E as minus delta B by delta C. So you have these four, four equations. And you have four vector fields. How do you solve it? Because for each vector, you should be able to specify its divergence and curve. To identify a vector, you should have a both divergence and curve. So, but here, we have four vector fields, we have only four equations. So we only, so really this system to be solvable, you really need a twice as many. For each vector, each, each vector you need two equations. So this system cannot be, cannot be the number. However, with what we have known here, that this PAB has the same property as the dual of F, which means the PAB is proportional to the dual F. So I have it. So what we should write is, is a PAB moment you write this as a some proportionality constant star FAB. Then I get that your so this establishes a relation between the these four vectors. Say the polar vectors are proportional to each other, and axial vectors are proportional to each other. So these four vectors collapse down to the two vectors. And then we, I have the four equations. And, and, and since we have this, that the divergence of uh, your <clears throat> star of PAB, which is the Bianchi part, is zero. So which would be you take as, which will be equivalent to that the divergence of V, FAB must be zero. And that double star is minus one. Nice. So that that is how we get the the remaining other part of the Maxwell surface. So what we have now got through is the that I we had the Bianchi part. And now this follows the other part. And if you want to introduce the sources, then it is here you introduce the fork 
conserved current so that all gives you is the the full full set of the Maxwell's equation and only trick which we try to uh, uh, try to use was that the <clears throat> scalar charge and pseudo scalar charge are equally are on the same two terminals equally. However, what tells you something more is which then tells you the scalar charge just say uh, uh, pseudo scalar charge and the scalar charge now they cannot be independent because we when we establish this, this relation between the uh, P and F, F then, then so which tells you the pseudo scalar charge and the scalar charge should be related and the one is the pseudo scalar charge which has a cardinality so that's a relation which should be a cardinal relation so pseudo scalar charge is q times the polar charge then theta where t theta is a universal constant for a, a given kind of particles. The most important thing here is that both charges, pseudo and the scalar charges, cannot exist simultaneously, cannot be independent simultaneously. They are always to be related. And this relation in a different context and probably it's more fundamental way was also obtained by Swinger. <clears throat> so, I always have problems with lots of papers writing, having both magnetic charge and the electric charge together. And the, the question is that, this, that with the two together, you cannot have a system which could, could be solved. Because for the each one, as we saw, for the E set uh, of vectors E or B or N or T, you require correlations. And so if you have both of them, then you require A equations to help. And then they cannot be independent. So the one, one thing which we realized in this thing was, that the both uh, polar and pseudo -scalar, uh, scalar and pseudo scalar charge cannot exist independently. They must, they must be always the case. Okay, so so that gives us your uh, so that when the force law is linear in for velocity, it's leads to the vector gear sweep. Now what I'm saying is this we did the Maxwell case, the simpler case of the abelian gear sweep. If the field is non-abelian, this whole argument will go through. Only you have to realize is that you have to how to define an appropriate derivative, what we call the J derivative derivative. And then all thing will work. You must also see here 
in this derivation, we made no reference to the space-time geometry. So this thing is valid for any space-time geometry, whether it is flat or whether it is curved. And we done this. How are we going to time? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Why can't this guy clock something wrong with it? <laughs> okay, so let, let's come to the more serious. Yeah. So now then let's come to the question about the quadratic. If the force law is quadratic about, so what do you say that? So the four force should be something like this. Now this should also follow from a Lagrangian, a scalar thing. So this should be a scalar which is made of, which is quadratic in the velocity. So you will have some so variation of that to give me this. So if I do this, do this variation, what do I get? I'll get something like this. PAB du UA by DS <coughs> equal to, uh, what do you say? Huh. PBC comma A, let me, I'll define in a minute what it is. You have an UB, sorry, UB, UC, right? And this PABC, PBCA is one half of PBA, comma C plus. P A C comma B minus P. Sorry. Oh, I'm going to on jumping all the steps. P B C comma D. So that's that is what we this is a four force. It should be orthogonal to the four velocity. So if I do this with the four velocity, uh, that should be um, oh, probably I did something wrong somewhere. Oh, uh, uh, this, this this was not this should have been B. Yeah, right. No. So now, yeah, I do it with U A. And it, it has to be zero. So what it tells you then is V, B, C, comma, A, U, A, U, B, U, C, must be zero. That could only be true. If your behavior is anti symmetric, when it's anti symmetric, then I have nothing. My, my the potential with which I start to be zero. So, so this, this thing cannot be consistent. So now here the question comes about. 
how to make a sense out of this. And whenever we, yeah, <clears throat> struck with something like this, you have to say, probably, we have to change the framework. That's all what you are doing, that probably is not the right one. And so how to make it consistent, and you will immediately see. Uh, ah, yeah. Can it go this way? Doesn't. Oh, it goes in. Ah, no. This is my. So anyway, this is. So can we make this thing, this equation sensible? And all of you will see that it, this equation will become sensible if you identify PAB with the space time metric. You identify with the space time metric then this thing is nothing but your four acceleration and which is always orthogonal for us. So the quadratic force law demands that the, the potential for the force has to be space-time metric. So this makes say, a fundamental break from all other things. So the, the quadratic force makes a demand that it is a space-time geometry, which could be, which is what I uh, describe, can describe the equation of motion of the uh, particle in this. So once you have the metric, then you, this is, that you already have this equation, and your, this PCB, this is your Christopher symbol. So. so you have your usual equation, you this, DOUA or DS is gamma ABC UBUC. <laughs> Here you will see the what we call the force is sitting in this this crystal symbol dotted with the with the formula. But you might see immediately on the question, but this gamma A B C are only involved the first derivative of the metric. Which I can make locally zero. And of course, that's one of the one of the basic things we require is that the gravity should be removed, the root should be removed locally. Your great principle of equivalence should be taken care. So, but then the question at the same time you want is that. This gamma ABC could be zero only locally, but not globally. Because if it is globally, then there is no force. You have this, this situation, is what we call the inertial forces, whereby 
choosing a, a, a suitable coordinates, you can remove the inertial force globally. Good. So for this to be not zero globally, the space time must have a curvature demanding the Riemann curvature must not vanish. This is the Riemann curvature, which will now drive the dynamics of gravity. And since Samara's again becomes a little more uncomfortable, let me try to come on. Moment I have a Riemann tensor. I have grabbed, I have the relativity. You know, one line thing. Because the Riemann tensor I have which satisfies the Bianchi identity. Take the trace of this. I get zero and GAB is RAB minus one half R GAB and your RAB is, is or anyway, it doesn't matter any symbol. So okay, let's just see you have a <clears throat> R A B C B. So Ricci is a contraction of Riemann. This tensor, second and symmetric tensor we have, is the Einstein tensor, which is built up of the Ricci and Ricci scalar. And this has divergence free. It has vanishing divergence. And then, the moment I have this, I say, oh, let me integrate this. And again, a very uh, no sweat integration. So you have a GAB and say, oh, let me put some another second axiometric tensor. Uh, plus something which is constant relative to the covariant derivative. This with, of course, this to be a solution, the new tensor which I have put in must be divergence free. So I demand this, its divergence must be zero. And now I say that can we make a sense of uh, this equation? Sure. What is on the left hand side is a second rank symmetric tensor, which is born out of the Riemann tensor. What does the Riemann tensor consist of? Riemann tensor consists of the second derivative and the square of the first derivative, the metric. So here, on the left, I have a second order differential operator, uh, analog of your del square. Now, this will become an equation of motion for a force if on the right hand side I can identify the source which generates the Riemann tensor. It can almost end it. And so the new thing, this is the constant power, constant of integration, nothing to do. So this quantity, what should it this be? This should be something which is a universal physical property 
shared by everything which physically exists. Because that the force uh, is the presence of this makes the space time inhomogeneous for all particles without any qualification, whether it are massive or massless, whether it's charged or uncharged. So such a property well, uniquely is your energy momentum. Moment I identify this with energy momentum, I have the Einstein gravity. So here we obtain the Einstein gravity starting from demanding the particle equation of motion is quantitative in formulas. So, so we now we have from particle equation to the field equation, and the, from the field equation to the particle equation, and I already said for GR, it is, it is a trivial because the GR is, uh, field is described by the space time geometry and is the space time geometry which then naturally prescribes the particle equation of motion as the free motion related to the geometry. So, now, other, uh, the same thing we have seen happens for your uh, gauge field. Uh, that the gauge vector field is characterized by the equation of motion being linear in polarity. So here from the Equation of motion, we have to obtain the uh, a particle equation on motion. And of course, in the gauge field, you might say, how do I go from the field to the particle equation of motion? Now, this is very simple. When I know the field, that means I know the four, four vector potential. Right? This four vector potential, how does how could it how does it interact with the particle? The only the thing the particle has is for velocity. So that means the equation of uh, <clears throat> motion for the particle should come from this. Of course, you might as well say to the to the have a power raised to an just half a minute. Uh, then you say you vary this, you will get this equation. But I have first to fix this n. This n gets fixed equal to one if I want the thing to be Lorentz invariant. <laughs> And that's what. So, so we have proved that then both ways that uh, we have obtained the sort of deduce by the right thing from the given the particle equation motion the field and from the field to the particle equation motion. And the interesting thing here is a general characterization of the whole four fields in terms of the equation, particle equation being a linear in for velocity or quality in for velocity. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this venue is not in use next uh, lecture, but I'm sure there's time for a quick question and comment. Uh, John? I wonder about um, <clears throat> the effect of field quantization in your analysis where there the particle um, <clears throat> particles are created, destroyed, becoming part of the field and then reappearing out of the field. Would this lead to could this lead to any or oh, additional features? So yeah, yeah true that classical and quantum thing. Mm. They uh them 
and they joined together in the context of this, the four, our four uh, gauges of potential. Mm -hmm. So what it turns out is that if you want to study the rotation uh, in the transverse component of the potential, that will give rise to the, the, the field has a the spin one. And then you want it, the spin one field to be long range, then it should be massless. Similar things you could do for the gravity, that you take a linear approximation and you have the, like the Q here, you, uh, your A here, there you write the polarization vector in terms of this thing. But then also it turns out to be shown that it is the transverse components of that polarization of the gravity. So that would be giving a spin to me. So there is a a local connection to that. <clears throat> is there anyone online who is the question? Uh, oh, uh, you go first. I don't know. I was just wondering. Uh, so you started off with the equation of motion for particles, and then somewhere along the line you went to F A B. Oh. Uh, and then you concluded that the Q and the charge, scalar charge, uh, were not not uh, not independent. Yeah. Is that also a statement saying that the electric field and the magnetic field are always equivalent, and that that's why you can silence by choosing the gauge appropriately, you can uh, kill the let's say the magnetic field and only work with the electric field. So, what is it? So E and B are the manifestation of the same electric. So what we generally you should say is when the charge is at rest, the field it manifests in field what we call the electric. When the charge is moves, the field it manifests in what we call the magnetic. magnetic. This is a general de definition which we carry over for other fields as well. So, so like say in gravity, I decompose the wild tensor into the electric part, the femur, or the magnetic part, or internal you can even uh, decompose the entire Riemann tensor into electric and magnetic part. And that feature is this that they are dual of each other in this thing, and you uh, have these all things. Whenever there is a motion of sources, that will give rise to the magnetic. Okay? So that's how, in depending for what the situation is, in what form the, the port you experience is going to be. <coughs> Leading on from your relationship between uh, scalar and pseudo-scalar charge you dealt with, uh, have you checked the, the soundness of the uh, magnetic monopole idea direct? In, can you prove, could you examine this in the light of this treatment and make some comments about its existence or non-existence? Well, I so. <coughs> All I would say is this is my uh, own kind of uh, intuitive understanding that the magnetic monopole will not exist in a state. So if the all you, you have, it could be in a very uh, particular situations where something may look, but uh, but certainly, both electric and magnetic charges, both will cannot exist under the And since we know the one exists, right? And as a matter of the moment you have a relationship between the two, calling it electric or magnetic is a matter of choice. You, 
What will you call? You may call one that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he derived specific properties for this, which were very different. Oh, that is true, but once you have one, the property says, if I have only magnetic charge, right? So I will have a magnetic charge, which is a source of lecture field, other than it moves it as So that's the uh, we almost ran. I will have the last word. <laughs> well, uh, and I, and I actually may remember uh, that years ago there was uh, a member of staff with Peter Madison camp, camp, camp has called Jenny Niven. Yeah. And uh, Jenny Niven, uh, uh, work was greatly supported by Yevgen Ellis. She always wanted to uh, find this connection between the three parts of all and the Einstein. The, Field equations. And they were so it was really, uh, really important and they were corresponding a lot. And unfortunately, I think, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if she's still alive, but she would be very, very interested in this sort of presentation of yours. Uh, moving yeah. around uh, but the equation like, of motion to the Einstein field yeah. equations. No, no, that's a fairly low name, maybe very well, but uh, I don't remember what was the question she was, uh, whether it was the context she had in mind. I mean, the context she had in mind, she, she was wanting to show that there is a connection between, between the two. And also, she, what she wanted to do precisely was to derive uh, the equation of motion from the Einstein. This doesn't quite do the same, but, this, yeah. but at least this is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a great source of time. Oh, yes. I just want to know if you have access to the information. Yes, you will make it available. Uh, I'm from a suitable field, but that's a lot of But so thank you very much, and um, it will. Uh, it was great having Professor David here. He's been speaking for yeah. five yeah. days yeah. in the uh, uh, Alpine heat, and we're grateful that immediately he's been willing to give this talk. So, so thank you. Thank you.